I've always been fascinated by this. No, not the cup, inside. Okay, it's empty. See that? There at the bottom. That little bit of light. That shape that it makes. This could have easily just been like a single point of light or not really focus into anything. But instead we get this perfect little heart-shaped curve. I think this is amazing. It's a highly underrated facet of reality. Why is it that shape? And what shape is it exactly? To answer that, we need to talk about a person on a sled. Have you ever played Line Rider? It's a game where you can draw lines and a little person on a sled will ride on top of them. Whee! Instead of the usual game where you just try to make a cool course to sled through, let's play our own and restrict ourselves to a goal of going from here to there while making as smooth and uniform of a curve as possible and only using straight lines. How do you think you might do it? Just connecting these points with one straight line obviously won't cut it. This is far from smooth. The problem, of course, is these little discontinuities where two lines connect. <coughs> so obviously we're going to need more smaller lines to approximate a smooth curve. If I just, you know, go for it and start drawing small pieces towards a curve, well, it kind of works, but my curve shape gets really weird. I sort of lose track of where I'm going. I end up going too high or too low or just being inconsistent. Really, I'm just bad at eyeballing things. I have bad eyeballs. Okay, well, here, let's take one of my bad curves. What if we were to take each segment in here and extend it out in both directions? Well, notice the extended parts stay underneath the curve we're making. So doing this doesn't actually affect the sled. We end up with a sort of regular pattern of lines on the sides. Now here's the trick. Let's go the other way. Start with two lines representing the inbound and outbound paths. Connect the top of the first to the bottom of the second, then just below the first to just above the other, and so on and so forth. And what do you know? We get a pristine curve. Much smoother and more consistent than when I freehanded it. Plus, we have easy control over the incoming and outgoing directions from the lines we started with. What's going on here is surprisingly interesting. It's worth exploring the maths behind this and how it relates to the shape we saw in the coffee cup earlier. We've stumbled into something called envelopes. Envelopes? 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 Envelopes. To talk about envelopes, let's talk about curves. We can represent a curve implicitly as a function of x and y. f of xy equals zero. For example, a line looks like x plus y equals zero, a parabola like y minus x squared equals zero, and so on. Next, let's talk about families of curves. Well, when a mommy curve loves a daddy curve, uh, <clears throat> A family of curves is just a set of related curves, where each curve is described by a parameter, t. So like this curve might be t equals 0, and this one t equals 1.5, and this one t equals 3.14. We can make our implicit function give an entire family of curves by adding a parameter t. So f of x, y, t is equal to x plus y plus t equals 0. That would be a set of lines. Plugging in a t gives you a new line in the family, f of x, y equals 0. Here it would shift up and down. Okay, now we can really talk about envelopes. The envelope of a family of curves is itself a curve, which is tangent to a family member at every point. So we take a family of curves and we produce a new curve out of it. Our trick from before is exactly this. Here the family of curves are the lines we drew. We start with one line, then as t changes we shift over to the other line. We only drew a finite number, but if we considered all infinitely many lines, we would see a perfect curve appear. That curve is the envelope of the set of lines. I think envelopes are really cool because it's this really tangible thing. Like it's right there, that curvy part you see, that's the envelope. Not every family of curves has an envelope, this set of circles, these parallel lines. A family of curves also doesn't have to be made out of lines, they could be sort of wavy things or whatever. You can even have multiple envelopes for one set of curves. Okay, now, math time. What's really going on here? Let's zoom in on a curve from the family. It's got some parameter t. Somewhere on this curve, there's a point that's actually on the envelope. And that envelope is itself some kind of smooth function. How can we find this point on the envelope, knowing our function, f of x, y, t? Let's look at two nearby neighboring curves. Nearby, meaning that their parameters t are similar, like 0.5 and 0.51. In many cases, two nearby curves will have some place where they intersect. This certainly isn't always true, for example with parallel lines, but like I said, we don't always have an envelope. In this case, they do intersect, right over there. What happens if we chose curves that were even closer? 
so the difference in their parameter was really small. In the limit, as the curves approach each other, this intersection settles in on some point. This is how we define a point in the envelope. We can do this process for any t. We pick two curves, find their intersection point, take the limit as the curves approach each other at t, and we end up with a point on the envelope. Okay, we have this intuitive idea, but how can we make it into something concrete, something we can calculate? Let's look again at what we're saying. We have some place xy, where small changes to t result in the same xy. That is, the infinitesimally adjacent neighbors are intersecting there. If you know calculus, then you might see what's about to happen. If not, bear with me, you already have the crucial intuition. So if for this x, y, t, small changes in t result in small changes in x and y, well, we're comparing a small change in f of x, y, t to a small change in t. That comparison, that's a derivative. More specifically, the partial derivative with respect to t, since we hold x, y constant. So when the partial derivative of f with respect to t is zero, it means that changes in t don't change x and y at all, which is to say that the infinitesimally adjacent curves are intersecting. The partial derivative gives us the specific relationship to describe x, y, and t where this happens. The math backs us up on this too. We can take two curves with parameters t and u, rearrange their definition, then take the limit as u approaches t, and we see the definition of the partial derivative. This is the mechanism we can use to mathematically define and calculate the envelope. You may notice that the partial derivative expression is underspecified. It is an expression of t and x and y. So we need two things. The envelope is the curve that satisfies both f of x, y, t equals zero, which is saying it must be on a member of the family of curves, and the partial derivative of f with respect to t is equal to zero, as we just derived. We call these the envelope conditions, the conditions needed for a point to be in the envelope. You can use these ideas to actually calculate the specific envelope for a family of curves. I won't go into the math too, too much, but let's lay out how this would look for our lines from before. First, we define our family of curves. Here, it's a bunch of lines whose slope depends on t. Next, we take the partial derivative with respect to t. Now, we apply the envelope conditions. We set the partial derivative equal to zero and consider the original definition of the family. Finally, we just solve for the curve. For this example, we get the expression of a rotated parabola. In fact, this example is exactly equivalent to a quadratic Bezier curve, if you know what that is. This is itself pretty cool, but let's keep going. Finally, we return to the figure at the bottom of the coffee cup. It may not surprise you to learn that this too is the envelope of a family of curves. Each ray of light traveling in a straight line is a member of the family. When rays reflect off the curved wall, they are reflected in such a way that certain rays will intersect. Now this intersection, it does in itself produce light. Photons pass right through each other, basically. But you probably have an intuitive understanding that rays of light will be brighter when they converge. Think of a magnifying glass. It's converging rays from the sun. So if we consider nearby rays of light reflecting off the coffee cup, they will produce the brightest spot where they intersect. That's the shape we see, because we most easily see the brightest part. This is called a caustic reflection of light. And it should be very clear how this relates to envelopes. We even have all the tools we need to calculate what this shape is. We can use geometry to find what these reflected lines are and how they relate to a parameter t. They look like this. Here our parameter t is essentially the angle between the point on the edge of the light and where it's hitting on the cup. Now we can apply the envelope conditions. So taking the partial derivatives and the original curve, we now have two equations of lines. Solving the system of equation gives us these parametric equations. This function produces exactly the heart-shaped curve we saw at the beginning. I think it's cool that we can use envelopes to find what this shape is. We use geometry to set it up, but ultimately we had to use a little bit of calculus and some intuitive understanding to really get to the bottom of what's going on. Envelopes are a pretty nifty tool. I love that you can see them appear out of nowhere, and you can use a pretty general method to compute their exact shape. Thanks for watching. Now you have all the tools you need to look at the bottom of a mug.